Um, Prasa, I think you muted. Are you speaking? Thanks, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I guess this should happen in almost every uh, Zoom call. Uh, anyway, welcome to this course. Uh, this is CSS 307.1, uh, Algebra and Computation. And uh, uh, so my name is Abhisa Sapkarishi. I was hoping to see like more of the people that I have not had an opportunity to interact uh, with. And uh, we'll see how this goes. So, uh, so let me start off by getting a few administratory things out of the way. Uh, okay. Uh, so roughly speaking, we would have about three to four problem sets. And uh, I mean, this is what I have in mind and maybe there'll be an exam. One of these problem sets might become an exam, something of that sort. And usually all of these things you have about a week or two weeks uh, to turn in. But if it's an exam, of course, the time frame will be much shorter. Uh, and I'll stress on one thing, which is that, uh, uh, I mean, I would like to encourage anything that influences you to try the problem sets uh, more. Like if that means that collaboration helps, please go ahead. Uh, and if that means that, you know, I don't want you to get too stressed out about, oh man, we need to submit the problem set by this deadline. And like, if you miss the deadline, just give up on doing the problem set or something. I mean, don't worry about any of this. I mean, it's just that I don't want to fix any policy because it somehow seems to have a, an adverse effect on people attempting things. Uh, so yeah, so I'll just say that, you know, I'll be reasonable about deadline. deadlines are so that, you know, you don't just slack off and just think you'll do it right towards the end of the course because that doesn't happen. Uh, so it gives you some way of at least, uh, you know, having a certain time frame and uh, submitting uh, stuff. Uh, yeah, so that's well, that's what I'll say about the deadline. So the notes I'll keep putting it up on the course web page. So there will be, uh, I mean, I'll try to maybe you know maybe put one Dropbox folder or something where all the notes are constantly being uploaded, which you will have access to. Uh, the other thing would also be you can also be you can also get uh, notes from Academy. I'll keep putting these handwritten notes, but if you want notes that you can use as a reference material for maybe reading up on things which perhaps was not covered well or something. Uh, I would highly recommend uh, a set of notes that was written by students in TIFR in one of the previous offerings of the course. I mean, those notes are really extensive and uh, I think it's very, very well written. Uh, but there are a few inaccuracies there, which uh, we have just glossed over. I mean, maybe it's you now we wrote it then and then we didn't really go back to inspect it or something. So there's certainly scope for improvement in those notes. So here's the thing. I mean, like, I mean, 10, you, you have up to 10% of bonus score for your final credit just by improving the notes. I mean, if that means, you know, maybe you find typos, maybe you say that, okay, this particular way of explaining things was not, you know, I somehow didn't understand this well. I somehow thought this other perspective was better anyway. I mean, any sort of way in which you can contribute to improving the notes. I mean, these are points that are up for grabs and, uh, and also, since I don't want to keep emailing people, you know, spamming everybody about who's interested in the course or not interested in the course, I mean, we are going to be managing the course on Academy. It's a platform that we have been using for the last few courses. And I think it is one of these intuitive uh, places, uh, course management things. And so at least as long as we are in the online model, we will, we will use Academy and all announcements, et cetera, will come from, uh, from there. So if you're not yet on Academy, I mean, please email me so that I can add you to uh, the course. Uh, okay, so so okay, so with that out of the way, so let me start with you know what this course is about. And roughly speaking, this is the like a one sentence answer for what this course is going to be about. It's it's an attempt to try and understand various computational aspects of uh, or on some mathematical objects that end up being studied like you know in various uh, guises okay uh, like for instance what sort of mathematical objects are we talking about the simplest of them are just uh, numbers okay you're dealing with numbers there are certain computations you want to do on those numbers and those may be one sort of topics that you that you care about or maybe you're interested in polynomials. 
Okay. Like again, there are computational questions you could ask about polynomials. Does your polynomial have this property? Can you do certain kinds of things with these polynomials, etc.? Or maybe there are these abstract concepts that we that we may have encountered, which I don't know how many people here. Uh, I mean, how familiar people are with it, but we'll deal with them slowly. So there are these things called groups, and then there are these things called fields, and then there are these things called rings. And there are more sophisticated things, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, these are all, I mean, like they're just names, but it's more like I want to think of it from the concept. I mean, always have a certain utility in mind. Like you're interested in a particular sort of problem. And if it so happens that that problem requires you to understand a bit more about fields or rings or something, well, so be it. Okay. So that's the sort of thing that we want to ask. And what do I mean by saying that, you know, we are interested in certain kinds of computational. Uh, questions about these numbers. So we could ask the following. So if I give you A and B, can compute, uh, I mean, let's say the simplest is just compute the product A times B. Like how quickly can you do that? Like A and B are some n bit numbers, and how quickly can this be done? So for example, can you ask, is A prime? Okay. Or can you factorize? Okay, factorizing. So these could be some questions that you may be interested in. It may not be the case that all of them are efficiently solvable or not, but that's the goal of this uh, of this course, to try and get a sense of, okay, what are things that I can solve? And what sort of tools do I have at my disposal? And, uh, and turns out many of these questions is something that you can also ask about polynomials. Because you could say, I give you two polynomials and I ask you, can you compute the product? Can you check if the polynomial is prime once we define a notion of what prime is? Something that makes sense. Or I give you a polynomial, can you factorize the polynomial? You know, those are things that you could ask. And depending on how familiar you are with groups, rings, or fields, I mean, maybe you have your own favorite uh, questions about uh, some groups, some fields, some rings, or whatever, and so on. And this is going to be the, the purpose of this course. We are going to take certain computational questions which naturally show up in various other uh, in various other setups and try and build tools towards under, like solving these questions, which will hopefully be helpful in other uh, other regards. Okay. So I mean, one thing that you could ask is you know, why do you care about these things? I mean, like, you know. For people who, who generally work in algebraic stuff, these things, of course, show up very naturally. But are things like this useful for people who perhaps don't work on this? Like, why is it necessary for you to understand them? So uh, the, the main point is that it has uh, many uh, applications in other areas. Okay, so in fact, uh, I would have said that you know before uh, deep learning etc became uh, as massive as it is, I would I would perhaps have conjectured that the algorithm that is perhaps computed the most often, you know, in the world is probably the fast Fourier transform. Okay, like the, it's one of the most ubiquitous algorithms that you could uh, think of, and right now. I guess the algorithm is like matrix vector multiplication or something, given how important uh, neural nets, et cetera, have turned out to be. And these are all things that under the hood is some algebraic computation. Okay, so it's it's relevant that you know we understand how can how, how can we speed up those very basic computations. So it often turns out to be some primitives that you use in other other, you know, other problems that don't appear to be immediately related to algebra at all. Okay, and so I'll also say that this offers many tools, okay, which turn out to be very, very useful in uh, in several other uh, other aspects. Okay, so this is at least my reason as to why, and of, I, mean, I tend to work in more algebraic stuff, so I have a certain bias here, but I would like to somehow uh, 
convince you that you know problems that we are going to be studying in this course are very useful and that they're very relevant even if you don't you're not particularly a person who works in algebraic stuff these are very important tools to just have in your disposal okay so okay so that's what this course is going to be roughly about and in terms of the structure of the course the course i have sort of roughly split into three parts okay uh, so i'm going to talk about the first part is going to be on something called computational group theory i don't know how familiar you are with groups but i will be dealing about it from a very in some sense a fun perspective like uh, so uh, i mean in some sense we'll be doing this via uh, solving some form of puzzles you know like the rubik's cube or uh, many of these other puzzles etc to me i'm just going to use that as a gateway to tell you more about groups okay but uh, the more important thing i mean like you know on paper if someone asks why do you study group theory and if you want to be more serious you can say that it is very useful for uh, fundamental problems like say graph isomorphism okay so graph isomorphism is a problem that we'll soon define and uh, uh, it's it's a very very important problem that has seen some monumental progress in the last about 5 uh, years i think 2017 was a, there was a major result on this uh, and in fact a lot of computational group theory was often uh, i mean many of these techniques and tools were developed in order to attack the graph isomorphism problem and it saw success i mean it had seen partial success but it saw major success uh, by babai uh, in 2017 so that's what part 1 is going to be about but i'm going to use uh, things like the rubik's cube etc to tell you more about the sort of things that are studied in computational group theory and we will see some baby cases of graph isomorphism and so how computational group theory helps with that but i certainly won't be doing babai's result and we won't be going close to that but uh, the notes from the previous offering has a bit more detail than what i will be covering in this course I mean, in this course, what I want to do is I want to give you this as a tool, and not really go too deep into how you can use this tool to solve, like probably the most general form of graph isomorphism or something. We'll do some special cases just to see the utility of this tool. So that's going to be part one of the course. Part two of the course is going to be about polynomials, and these will involve things like uh, what are called, I mean, the the fast Fourier transform. or what's called the newton uh the newton raphson method i think i am butchering the spelling of raphson uh and there's also a different way of version of this which is called hensel lifting we'll do all this in order to study the sort of questions we asked last time which was you know if i give you two polynomials can you multiply them quickly or if i give you two polynomials and i say you know uh, i want to divide one by the other if one is divisible by the other can you do that quickly or uh, maybe you are interested in factorizing a polynomial maybe you care about whether a polynomial is prime i mean once we know a notion of what prime means so so those sort of questions we will we will do in part 2 and part 3 is going to be about integers and i will do uh primality testing uh i mean i think i have committed a crime in the last few offerings by actually not doing primality testing in the part of this course uh so this time we will see primality testing and then we will see some heuristic algorithms for factorization some really clever ways of uh Fact, uh, coming up with factorization algorithm of course they will not be polynomial time because if they were then lots of other things will break uh, but nevertheless i mean this is going to be the starting point of so this is going to be the rough structure of the course uh, my guess is that they will roughly take about 7 to 8 lectures each uh, that's what i have in mind but maybe we will move things around uh, you know as the course evolves so good so that's going to be the rough idea of what the course is going to be so let me start off by telling you what the graph isomorphism question is 
Okay. You may have seen this as a part of your algorithm scores or maybe in some other context, but nevertheless, I will tell you what uh, the problem is. And I'll try to give you by example. Okay. Here are three different graphs. Okay. And I want you to tell me if, if I said an, a, truth, a truthful statement or a, did I lie? I mean, are these graphs actually different? Okay. So the point is, I mean, they're all, they're all eight vertex graphs. And they all seem to have degree three. And uh, on the face of it, they look different because it seems like, you know, nothing, by the way, this thing is, I mean, I couldn't draw this better. Basically there are four vertices here, four vertices here. Vertex number I on the left is connected to everything but I on the right. That's the structure of this. Uh, okay. So they seem to have the right number of edges. They seem all seem to have the same number of edges. They all look in some sense similar, but they also look different. And I, and the graph I some some question is, can you actually tell me if they are different or not? Okay. So we need to formalize this notion of what do we mean by it is different? I mean, or what do we mean by two graphs are basically the same? Okay. I guess the easiest to sort of see that they are the same is maybe this and this, because if you think of this square as sort of being this guy and the one behind as being whatever this thing, it's like a slightly squished up version of, you know, what this graph is. Okay. This is perhaps a little more like counterintuitive to see how you move, but I'll let you actually figure this out. Okay. So let's be formal. So what do we mean by saying that two graphs are the same? And this is what is defined as the notion of isomorphic. Okay. We will say that two graphs, G1 and G2, and let's say they are on N vertices. I mean, okay, N will usually refer to the number of vertices are uh, isomorphic if, okay, informally, let me make a statement. Uh, there is a relabeling uh, of vertex names. that preserves edges and non-edges. Okay. This is just an informal way of uh, saying what graph isomorphism is. If one has to be very formal, then what you would say is that, okay, firstly, if the two graphs are on different sets of vertices, or rather different number of vertices, they're of course not isomorphic because even the vertex sets don't match. So let's assume that they're both on some n set of set of n vertices. So we will say that two graphs are isomorphic if there exists some bijection that maps the n vertices of the first graph to the n vertices of the second graph. It's it's just saying that by the way, vertex whatever you called vertex one in this graph is actually vertex seven or something of that sort. Okay. Uh, and what do we want to say? You want such a bijection such that I, I want to say that I comma J is an edge in the graph G1, if and only if sigma I sigma J is an edge in the graph G2. So I want to say that after I do this relabeling, after I rename the vertices as whatever, I want edges in the first graph to go to edges in the second graph and non-edges in the first graph to go to non-edges in the second graph. And uh, this uh, sigma is a bijection. Okay, that's the formal statement. If you were to sp spell it out mathematically, this is what we would say. And the notation that is used for this is to basically, uh, okay, which is this, whatever, the isomorphic symbol, which is to, whenever you see the symbol, you should just tell yourself that these two graphs are basically the same. You know, it's just a question of perspective, like what we are calling vertex one and vertex two, as long as the vertex names are something we are allowed to change, there's no difference between the two graphs. So there are plenty of other ways of describing the same thing. If you write down the adjacency matrix, you're asking, is there a way of shuffling the rows such that you apply the same shuffling on the columns and you somehow transform one adjacency matrix to another adjacency matrix? I don't know which of these is a 
is a better thing to think of. But to me, intuitively, I mean, it's the informal statement that I think is somehow more insightful. It's just that you're basically saying, is there a way of just renaming stuff so that it's basically the other one? And like the difference between the two is perhaps just in the thing of what do we call, what did we name the vertices? And as long as we don't care about the names, we say that these two graphs are isomorphic. Okay, this is just the definition of what isomorphism is. So now that you know what isomorphism means or between two graphs, uh, you can ask the following computational question, which is that if I give you two graphs G1 and G2 as input, can you design an algorithm that oh, checks sir, whether, I... yeah, uh, Shantanu, go ahead. Uh, sir, just a moment, sir. I Actually, I want to say something about the first problem. Uh -huh. It's just an idea, I'm not sure that if uh -huh. I tied the adjacency, adjacency matrix for the this all three graphs, uh -huh. The graphs and we can show somewhat that all three adjacent matrices are similar, then we can't conclude that the, this G1 is isomorphic to G2. So, uh, uh, what, ex what precisely do you mean by similar? Okay, similar matrix means there exists someone, some kind of invertible matrix such that A uh, sigma 1 equal the adjacency is a matrix of the first one equal to A sigma 2 into A inverse. Yeah, so so that's very good. So if the two graphs are isomorphic, it will turn out that the adjacency matrices are similar, but it's not an if and only if. So it means that but, is not true. It, yeah, but the point is you can actually modify your statement to make it true. It will turn out that if there is a if there is a way in which you can convert one to the other, you were saying that write down the first matrix as something like a adjacency yes. times a inverse. Yes, sir. If that A happens to be a permutation, matrix, then this is true. Okay. Then they are exactly the same. But uh, but yeah, but uh, that's very good. So in fact, graph isomorphism has plenty of ways of rewriting what the definition is. Okay. But turns out similarity is very close to what you want, but it's not quite the same. Okay. Okay. But yeah, but you're you're very right. If you notice that the adjacency matrices are not even similar to each other. You can very well say that no, the answer is no. These two graphs are not as good. But the problem is that the adjacency matrices could be similar, but maybe the graphs are still not as good. That's the problem. Okay. okay, but in general, what we want would want to ask is like I give you two graphs as input. Is this something you can do efficiently? Okay. And uh, this problem has been very well studied. So, firstly, uh, I mean, I'm assuming that. I mean, you don't need this. We will not really deal with this much. Is that there's this class called NT, which maybe you have seen in other courses, which basically says that suppose the graphs are isomorphic. Can I give you a short certificate to guarantee that it's isomorphic? And I mean, in fact, by definition, it is true because the certificate is this bijection. If I told you, by the way, here is a bijection that shows that G1 and G2 are isomorphic, you can, of course, verify it efficiently. So it turns out to be in NT. Okay. But it turns out that it's unlikely to be empty hard for some other reasons. Okay, so it's not one of these problems that we believe to like that we have a lot of confidence to say that it is super, super hard. I don't expect to solve this in polynomial time or something of that sort. And to make matters worse, it turned out that it was not known to be empty. I mean, it's still not known to be empty. But there are like a gazillion subcases that are all known to be empty. Okay, it almost feels like just come up with your favorite uh, subclass of graphs and ask, okay, can I do graph isomorphism for that subclass? For almost all of them, it turns out that the answer is yes. Like some of most natural subcases turn out to be in polynomial. So it was one of these really annoying questions that we don't really believe to be very hard, but at the same time, we don't know how to put it in T, but almost every damn subcase turned out to be. Okay. And finally, in 2017, there was a major breakthrough by Latsi Babai that showed that, well, okay, fine, it's not quite in T yet, but at least there is a running time, there's, a, there's an algorithm that runs in time n to the poly log n. Okay, it's certainly much, much better than exponential, uh, but it's not quite polynomial time yet. And uh, this used this computational group theory on steroids. I mean, like, it's like a, like a really, uh, complicated, uh, I mean, a lot of tools put on top of computation group theory. In fact, much of computation group theory was, was devised in order to attack this problem. 
So uh, just uh, there's a chat message, which is, uh, uh, so can we relate this with the permutation group SN, some rotation of vertices? Yes, hold that thought, because that's going to be the crux of what we are going to do the rest of the lecture. I mean, and if I haven't answered the question by the end of the lecture, I'll get back to you. Okay, so this is why, this is what the graph isomorphism problem was. I mean, I started out with group theory and now I'm starting to tell you about some graph isomorphism. So the question, what's the connection between them? Okay, so let's try to abstract things out and try to make a more general statement and somehow discover that groups somehow show up when you make these general statements. Okay, so the more general statement is the following. Let's say you have two kinds of objects, some G1 and G2. Okay, the previous thing, those two objects turned out to be graphs. And there are certain legal ways to, to rename them or somehow shuffle it. You know, like for instance, if we rename vertex one to vertex two or vertex one by A and vertex two by B, then an edge that was between them will now have to go an edge between A and B or something of that sort. So there are some rules about how you are allowed to relate. So there are, which I just refer to as legal shufflings. Okay, there are certain things that you can do to rename stuff. And you want to know, is there any way of legally shuffling G1 in order to get G1? Okay, and can we do this efficiently? If there is a way of doing it, can you do this efficiently? Okay, and this feels like a strange thing to say, but you've all encountered problems of this sort. And in fact, these are all puzzles that you may have you know, like played with when you were young. Okay, just think of them as the following. So somebody gave you, let's say a Rubik's cube, which is in a particular configuration. That is my object G1. And think of G2 as a Rubik's cube, which is completely solved. Like, you know, it's the nice uh, solved configuration. That is G2. And now what are the legal shufflings? The legal shufflings are the moves that you're allowed to. You can turn this phase, you can turn that phase, et cetera, et cetera. Those are what you're allowed to do. And you're asking, is there a way to do, uh, you know, some form of this shuffling that converts the cube in the current state to the solved configuration? Okay, that may, that's one question. The second thing could be like, can you actually find this efficient? Can you find such a transformation efficiently? Uh, okay, uh, so can so Saurav asks, can you give an example where the if part does not hold in the case of similarity? I was actually planning to put this in the problem set. So here is a spoiler alert. So this is going to be one of the questions that will show up in the first problem set for you to just come up with two graphs whose adjacency matrices happen to be similar, but they're actually not isomorphic. Uh, but I'll give some hints there. You know. Uh, good. So, okay. So therefore these are the sort of puzzles, which all seem to look like some analogs of graph isomorphism. If we are willing to take certain liberties to sort of say, they're not quite graphs, but there are these other sort of things. And, uh, that there's a notion of some sort of legal shuffling, etc. Uh, so by the way, how many people have uh, not encountered these puzzles? I, I presume at, at least one of these things you would have seen. Uh, these are what are called these 15 puzzle thing, which is like there is a cell and you keep moving pieces and your goal is to get one, two, three, four in the right order. That's thing. This is something that I had not seen. I have not played with this before, but it's apparently a very popular puzzle uh, in the US and stuff, uh, which is something called the oval track or the top spin puzzle, which is again, you have a bunch of numbers with, I mean, not whatever, a bunch of these disks that have certain numbers in it. And there are two kinds of things that you can do either. I mean, okay. Assuming this thing is like completely straight, you can move the whole thing, you know, like in a circular, I mean, you can, you can cyclically shift all of them, or you could do this weird move, which is this top spin. So once you have four things in this intermediate belt, you can sort of turn them around. So what ends up happening is like one will go in the place of four and two will go in the place of three. And these are the only two moves you're allowed to. And now somebody scrambles this and gives it to you. And your job is to figure out, you know, what is the, what is the best way to get back to the original configuration? Or maybe someone is really devious and gives you a configuration, which is actually not solvable. Like there's just no way to get to the final configuration. So will you be able to figure this out? 
Okay, so these are all questions that seem like the graph isomorphism problem in some guys. Okay, and uh, so what we are going to do is like we are going to somehow take these sort of questions and phrase them in a way such that we will tell ourselves, ah, okay, what we need to study are some groups, and we'll try to then ask questions about those groups. Okay, so now let's ask ourselves, what is some properties about uh, these puzzles? Is that there is a particular? There are two nice things that you often have in these puzzles. There is a set of moves that you are allowed to do in any configuration. You have a certain configuration, like if you have a Rubik's cube, you can turn the up face, you can turn the front face, or whatever. I mean, I said up and pointed to the left, something, whatever. There are a bunch of faces that you are allowed to turn. In the top spin thing, you can either do a cyclic shift clockwise or anti-clockwise, or you can turn the top spin, etc. But something that is always there is that these moves are often composable. That is, I can make move one and then make move two and then make move three, etc. And they behave in some reasonable way. Like in fact, if I have to throw in a buzzword, they behave associatively. Like doing three moves in a row, I don't really need to tell you how the brackets work. Like do A followed by B and then at the end do C. Is the same thing as saying you do A followed by B and C. So somehow these brackets don't seem to be very relevant. So that's what I'll call composable in some sense. And secondly, all these moves appear to have inverses. Like you can always undo them. Like if you turn the face clockwise, you can of course turn the face anti-clockwise. So you undo those moves. Okay. So they have this sort of structure. And in general. Things that follow this associative and uh, invertible sort of structure naturally leads us to these things called groups. Okay, so let me just define what a group is. Here is the formal definition. Uh, you may have seen this in some context, but uh, I'm just going to spell it out. But mentally tell yourself that it's something in which everything is undoable and everything is composable. Okay, so formally speaking, what is a group? A group is a set that on it has some binary operation, which is usually referred to as star. Most often, this binary operation will be understood from context. So often, people don't even write this binary operation. But normally, when people say a group, it's like a set followed by an operation. That's the data of what a group is. And what is this data supposed to satisfy? Okay. The first thing is there must be a do nothing operation, which is what is called identity. Okay, and what does do nothing mean? Basically, do nothing followed by some move is the same thing as some move followed by do nothing, which is some. It's like saying that do nothing does nothing. Basically, it's just a convoluted way of saying that. Okay, so formally speaking, for every element a in the group, I want to make sure that uh, id star a and a star id they're both equal to a. Okay. By the way, if there is a, if there is a chat message that I end up missing or something, just alert me. To it. Somebody alert me to it. Then. Okay. So that's step one, which is just the existence of an identity. Okay. Step two is this notion of composability, which is that it's just saying that it is associated. So whenever I have a star b star c, I can choose to drop the brackets because it doesn't matter how you put the brackets. The answer is still going to be the same. Okay, so that's what uh, this means. And finally, the third thing is the fact that everything has an inverse. That is, for every element A you have in the group, there is always an element A inverse, such that A times A inverse and A inverse times A is identity. There is a way of undoing whatever you are doing. Okay, so here are some simple exercises. These are, I think, exercises that you think you need, you need to solve once in life. Okay. I mean, you just need to do that once to get yourself comfortable with it. And once you're done that, you can just, I mean, this just becomes a part of your, some sort of muscle memory. Okay. The first thing is notice that the way I have defined it, I didn't really say that identity was unique, but turns out that it is, and it's a very simple one line proof. I'll just let you think about it. Okay, I mean, if you have thought about it, I mean, this is like completely obvious to you. I mean, if you haven't thought about it also, it should be obvious to you, but I will still let you think about it. And similarly, the way I have said what A inverse was, 
I didn't say that A inverse is a U, there is a unique inverse. Okay, but turns out it will turn out to be unique. Okay, again, I'll, if you haven't seen this before, you should see you should do this once in your batch and just convince yourself that this is true. Okay. And there are plenty of examples that people can give about groups, which is that you know, you take your set of integers under addition, or maybe the set of rational numbers, you know, under addition, or maybe you remove zero and take rationals under multiplication. There are many standard examples. And one of the things I will sort of put in the Academy quiz or something, I would just like you to give me one of the most bizarre examples of groups you can think of. There are, there are always these pathological examples. It's, it's good to know a few of them. Okay, just to see that there are strange things that can happen with groups. And it's just good to have these markers on the side of the road to tell you that, you know, don't just take certain things for granted. Okay, so yeah, so anyway, so this is just a whatever exercise zero, etc. And to me, like the example of a group, and I will hope to somehow make this more precise overall, is the is what is called the symmetric group on a certain number of elements, okay, which is referred to as SN. Okay, or it's sometimes also referred to as sim of whatever you are shuffling. It's basically the set of all possible shufflings of a certain set of elements. Okay, so it's like pick up all possible bijections that you have on n elements, put them all in a bag, and turns out this is already a group where your the star operation happens to be the usual composition. Like you shuffle it using one rule, and then you shuffle it using some other rule, and since you are working with bijections, bijections are af applied after another bijection continues to stay a bijection. So it forms a group. All bijections have an inverse. There is, of course, the identity bijection, which is doing nothing. So it satisfies all the properties that you want the group to satisfy. So in some sense, this is like, in, I mean, we'll soon make this a bit more precise. It like, turns out it's like the example of a group. Okay, like, uh, I'll try and make it more precise over the, over the course of this. Okay, so, okay, so therefore, since we were dealing with these sort of puzzles, somehow naturally underlying it, there appears to be a, like a group somewhere. Like because there is this notion of things that can compose with each other nicely. There is a notion of things where you no, know, it can invert. I mean, everything that you're doing has an inverse and so on. But what really is the group here? I mean, are we saying that the set of all configurations on the Rubik's cube, is that a group? Or is it something to do with what sort of moves you can do, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to crystallize that a bit more. Okay. And uh, with respect to that, I will sort of give this general dogma, which is like very, very useful, which is that sometimes you can learn a lot about an object by not studying the object directly, but rather looking at what it does to other things. Okay. So it's action on others. So we are going to start talking about what group actions are. Okay, and that will then let us pre be precise about solving this Rubik's cube or et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so, so here is an informal definition of what is a group action. Okay, a group action, when you say that a group acts on a set sigma, it's just a shorthand notation for saying every element of the group ends up shuffling sigma. Okay, like there is a way of thinking of every element of the group as a particular way of shuffling sigma. But I mean, this, this way of thinking about it must, uh, must, must be reasonable when it comes to, you know, inverses, composition, et cetera, on the group side. Okay. So I'm being a little vague here. So what do we mean by that? So what we are saying is just the following. For every group element G and G, there is some permutation rho G, which is a shuffling of sigma such that the following properties should hold. What are the properties we would like to hold? So let's ask ourselves, you know, if we want to think of every element of the group as some form of shuffling, like something reasonable that we may want is that maybe the shuffling that corresponds to the identity element. Okay, I would like this to be the identity. I mean, otherwise it just feels like, you know, I'm just, I took some set of elements and I'm just calling it some random things. I mean, the underlying structure of the group is just not there. Okay. So that is one thing. And secondly, we might want things of this form. 
so whenever i have rho g1 uh, uh, okay rho of g1 g2 so g1 g2 is some element of the group and this map says that that g1 g2 corresponds to some shuffling and i want to say that this is the same thing as you apply g1 and then you apply g okay so again i mean this is the notation that at some point will annoy somebody i mean since we are used to reading from left to right and i'm going to always say that whenever i have a sequence of things i always think of it as like you apply this and then apply this okay it's slightly i mean here let me just put a warning that this is not the same thing as rho g1 composed with rho g2 because that's like you apply this first and then this okay one of us has to <laughs> change our mindset so i am just going to uh, okay so this is not the same as this okay so it's one of these things that you need to uh, it's you 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 need to get used to it but uh, hopefully i mean we'll stick to this notation that whenever we see things written down it's like i tell you in the order in which you need to apply it okay it's just some minor rewiring in the head that needs to happen to be okay with this okay so that's uh, one and one other property that i would like is that the row the shuffling that corresponds to g inverse must be the inverse of the shuffling corresponding to g okay so this is what a group action is it's just some way of referring to every element of g as some element here that somehow preserves the group structure okay a buzzword at this point is also that there's a notion of what's called a homomorphism which I'm, i'll define at a later point it's just a way of creating a homomorphism from g to the symmetry group but basically it's just a way of saying for all practical purposes i want to think of elements of g as basically elements of sim of sim of omega okay there are some caveats here these are all caveats we will we'll figure out at a later point but that's what a group action basically is so this is the sense in which we are saying that as long as you have a group g acting on sigma you might as well think of g as some form of a symmetric group because basically what g is doing is shuffling elements okay that's the reason why these group actions are very useful because often you could have the same group that acts on multiple elements like many different sorts of things and studying those actions might maybe tell you a, a few secrets of the group that you otherwise didn't know okay and that's what we are going to do so this is right now an abstract definition i mean you now people may be getting a little lost so let's take a few examples to sort of see to get our hands dirty to get a sense of you know what's going on okay so let's take uh, let's take the oval track puzzle because i think this is something that maybe we have not seen uh before okay and let's ask ourselves there is some underlying group here okay so there are certain moves that you can do there is a cyclic shift move and there is a top spin move okay both of these moves ends up shuffling these uh, how many pieces are there 20 pieces there are these 20 pieces that are there in this oval track and it somehow ends up shuffling these 20 pieces so let's precisely write down what are those shuffling so there are two moves that we have okay for top spin and oval track so one is the cycle okay which basically performs the following operation uh one goes to two uh okay two which goes to three uh etc etc and 19 will end up going to 20 and this 20 ends up going back to one so that is the whatever for the move cycle row cycle is this particular shuffle okay and similarly there was the top spin okay and what does this end up doing let's go and revisit that picture so if it i had 1 2 3 and 4 and i did the shuffling what would happen is one exchanges its place with 4 and two exchanges its place with three 
so so the other top spin is basically the permutation which is just this oh, sorry one goes to four and four goes to one and two goes to three and three goes to one whatever i have not written basically means that they stay wherever they are okay so these are two moves but you can ask if i just keep on applying these moves i get a whole bunch of different forms of shufflings whatever i end up getting at the at the whole stuff is what i'm going to call uh, whatever the group generated by by this we are being vague here but we hopefully understand what this means basically we are asking what are all things i can do using this obviously since you can do cycle you can do cycle inverse because you can always turn the other way over the top spin move turns out to be its own inverse because if you do this twice you get identity but now maybe you can do cycle followed by top spin followed by another cycle you can take some sort of weird sequence of these moves etc each of them will end up resulting in some shuffling at the moment it's unclear if you can come up with all possible shufflings of 20 elements or maybe you come up with some subset of them who knows okay at the moment we don't know this and let's just say that okay this is the group generated by this that's the group that we are interested in whatever is this big group g is acting on a set of 20 elements because the group g refers to all possible moves you can do and the things that are being shuffled are those 20 elements so in the previous example it so happens that omega is some set of size 20 this group is some g which i don't even know what it is i mean i just have some sort of weird mental picture of what this group is okay so i hope uh, this you no know, gives a bit more of you know, what is going on here okay good now let's look at the rubik's cube group and for the sake of writing it on paper i am looking at a 2 cross 2 cross 2 cube instead of a 3 cross 3 cross 3 cube uh just because i mean like it's just fewer things to work so a cube is something of this sort and since we want to deal with it let's just put a name to every damn sticker on this cube okay so since i mean i don't have the ability to you know to sh show 3d pictures here or something i just sort of like opened up the cube what this is like this face is where is this thing and this face is this the one on the left is whatever is whatever whatever the the left face is what i have written here and this is the right face and this one is the back face the one that is behind it so just think of it as like a box being opened up okay keep the front face there is a, there's a flap that comes on this side and there are two flaps that come on this okay and i've just written the numbers in like clockwise order in each of the faces in some systematic fashion and these are just names for those stickers okay and now we can sort of say what are moves you are allowed to do previously we basically said the top spin or oval track puzzle had two moves which was the cyclic move or it's the top spin move or these inverses of these and so on so similarly on the cube you can do a whole bunch of moves you can turn the up face you can turn the left face right face blah 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 so let's just take one example okay so if i were to turn the up face clockwise okay that is what is happening is uh, so i am basically uh, turning this clockwise the the top face alone i'm going to turn clockwise what is this permutation correspond to which stickers move to which stickers so 1 2 3 4 are so, like just going in a right. cycle one will go to two which goes to three which goes to four which happens to go back to one and okay. then the whole then what else? the whole the 5 to 18 uh, right. thing so also goes something happens here but what precisely let's be more precise about it let's see is it the case that 18 goes to 17 17 goes to uh -huh. 14 etc etc is that what is happening no no there is like two cycles happening here right so so where will 18 end up going if i turn clockwise eight or okay let's ask where will 14 end up going 14 uh, is this thing 
10 that 14 thing should come to where 10 is correct yes. right so that one is going to be uh, so there is 14 which ends up going to where 10 is which should end up going to where uh, i mean this 10 will end up going here which is whatever was on i mean no on the side of this 9 on that other face so that is uh, 6 so that ends up going to 6 which ends up going to 18 and that should end up going to 14 that's one and then there's one more which is this other the 17 thing. so 17 ends up going to 13 which ends up going to 9 which ends up going to 5 and so on okay the rest of the of course everything in the bottom layer stays the same so this is just a representation of what the move up does it's like when we are talking about the Rubik's cube group or something, it's hard to get a handle on what exactly we mean by that. But once we name the stickers as 1 to 24, we can start talking about every Rubik's cube, whatever sequence of moves by some particular permutation of these 24 elements. Okay. And some something non-trivial happens. It at least gives us a way of handling, you know, getting some mental picture of what this what this thing is. So again, we'll sort of say that R2, 2, 2 is the, we'll just call this the group generated by whatever legal moves. Okay. Like you can turn the left face, the right face, the up face, down face, front, back. Maybe you can rotate the cube itself. What you're not allowed to do is take it apart and put it back. Okay. But uh, these are the moves that you're allowed to do. So you end up coming up with some group, which again is, I mean, like it's hard to describe exactly what the group is, but we sort of know what the group is because we sort of know what each of its, whatever generating moves does. And we are hoping to answer some useful questions about that. Okay. At least this is just some setup for what it is. And since I'm always talking about what the hell is this group generated by a set of legal moves, etc., let's just come up with one definition, which is what is called a subgroup. A subgroup is a subset that is a group. That's it. Okay. It's just a fancy way of saying something. It's just like it's some subset of your group, which in itself happens to satisfy all the axioms you want a group to satisfy. Like that subset contains the identity. In that subset, if there are two elements, if you multiply them together, the product also happens to be in the subset. Inverses of things in the subset stay in the subset, etc. Cetera, et cetera. All the nice properties that you want is satisfied. So now you can talk about what is called the group generated by something, which is given any subset of moves, which is like up, down, front, left, etc. You could ask, what is the smallest subgroup that contains S? I mean, if you want S to be in the subgroup, you're forced to add a bunch of other things. Like for instance, you, you, you're you forced to add, I mean, like, you know, if S, if some element A is there, you have to add A inverse in this subgroup. If two elements A and B are there, you have to add A, B to the subgroup. So there is the smallest subgroup that contains S. That's what we'll call the group generated by S. In some sense, you just do the natural thing of take all possible things you are forced to add, and stop whenever you are done. Okay, that's intuitively what this group containing things means. Okay, so there's a there's a couple of questions on the chat, which is that in the earlier example of the Rubik's cube, is it actually the set of all possible permutations of these twenty four stickers? And turns out the answer is no. Okay, because notice that if ten moves at a particular place, if this sticker ends up going somewhere. It can't be the case that 13 can go somewhere else. I mean, because whatever move you are doing, somehow these three stickers, they stick together. Yeah, RP, I think he said, uh, a is it a subgroup? Oh, yes, it is a subgroup of S24. Good, good, good. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, I, I, I misread the question. So, yeah, so, okay, this is excellent. There are people who are already asking, like, okay, we know that the Rubik's Cube uh, group is some subgroup of S24 because it happens to move these 24 stickers around. But what subgroup is it? 
you know is it some subgroup that we already know are there properties i guess it is a subgroup of a 24 yeah so sort of yeah, was asking if it is equal to a24 turns out it's not even a24 it's some bizarre group uh, okay but but great i mean these are the sort of questions we will want to do. like i am just saying that it's not a24 like you could ask me how the hell do you know that like you know s24 24 factorial is such a large number like you know how am i supposed to figure out that it's not this group it's something else etc so yeah so these are the sort of questions that we would want to ask so shantanu did you have some other question yes yeah, sir but can you, we can say that it is a subgroup of a24 uh a24. yeah it's prob- right right it's going to be a subgroup of a24 because of the way these moves are yes uh, sir uh, is that right i just want to hey can you recall what the alternating group definitions so basically oh, all permutations they have a sign which is like uh, the number even of, number of transpositions even yeah. number of transpositions so take yes. all those thing that have an even number of transposition that happens to form a subgroup yeah. and the question is is it even contained in that i actually am not sure but but these are all things we can answer okay i'll and i'll i'll show you how to answer them in this course okay so this is what a subgroup is and uh, let me give you an example of uh, of these things so sarav is also asking uh, are there efficient algorithms for each of the n cross n cross n rubik's cube problems the answer is yes okay and uh, we'll hopefully see i mean i mean how to do that on our own and so on. okay so okay let's take an example so i'm going to take s to be the following two elements okay the element that swaps 1 and 2 okay leaves everything else untouched and another element which is just the n cycle okay 1 goes to 2 2 goes to 3 blah, blah, blah. n minus 1 goes to n and n goes to 1 can someone tell me what is the group generated by these two there is two it's a generating set is of size 2 and we are just going to take all possible shufflings that we can obtain by either one n cycle and one transposition this is called the dn group i guess means so okay or okay let's in fact ask the following what is a ballpark size that you think the subgroup generated by these two is Yeah. it's certainly yeah. no more than n factorial because they are all subgroups of sn real yeah. n factorial yeah so turns out so the answer is that it is in fact n factorial the group generated by this is basically all of cement okay it's just bizarre in fact just convince yourself that if you do the cycle followed by the transposition followed by cycle inverse notice that you will get a different transposition so using this trick you can actually get all transpositions and once you have all transpositions you have the entire group so here is a bizarre statement which is that you know somehow the generating set was of size 2 like a measly two elements but somehow the group that it together generates is of size n factorial like you could have a very very succinct description of what a group is and in fact this is the reason why we were struggling to get our hands on what is this rubik's cube group i told you that oh, it is made up of this up fair you know up move down move left move right move front move back move whatever i told you six moves and said okay take the group generated by that i mean like at the at the face of it it doesn't seem like you know how large are these groups like you know how do you get a handle on what these groups are and uh, these are the sort of questions that we will be answering okay so the setup of all problems we will study in part 1 of this course will be of this type there will be some set omega which is the thing that has, that is getting shuffled and often this omega will be the set of n elements n is some parameter that we have okay and somebody will provide us some generating set and these are all going to be permutations of these n elements but the number of elements i will give you is going to be small we'll call that m you should be thinking of m as being something like i don't know order n squared or n cube or something like that okay like even though this is a group of i mean there are n factorial possible permutations that they are but i will give you a handful of them you know just like in the rubik's cube i will give you six of them one for each face or something of that sort 
Okay. So that's your input. The input is the group will be described to you by just telling you, by the way, it is a group generated by these bunch of things. And your job is to answer some questions about this group, but you're only allowed to run in time polynomial in N and N. Okay. And it's important. And I, I have to keep stressing that it is not polynomial in the size of the group. It's polynomial in the size of the representation I have given. Okay. What sort of questions are we interested in? Okay. What sort of questions do we want to ask? So we want to basically say things like, you know, we are interested in something useful about this group. Can you answer those questions efficiently? Okay. Uh, so, for, yeah. so, uh, so, so here, like, have we looked at, uh, so, uh, so for the Rubik's cube, for example, we are looking at just uh, like, uh, the moves are these, uh, legal permutations, but mm -hmm. like, have we seen this is like equivalent to which group acting on, like, have we seen this in terms of group actions yet? We didn't say anything. So about there's, that. I mean, like, in fact, I have not defined what the group is. The group itself, I'm defining by some hand right. I'm okay, basically saying whatever that. these things generate, that's my group. That's the Rubik's cube group. I mean, but at the moment, it's not insightful. And but these are still permutations. Right. These are all permutations and this yeah. naturally acts on some set of 24 elements. Right. Because right. by the way I have described it itself, I just named every element as some permutation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but we don't know what this group is supposed to be. Like maybe, you know, I just came up with some stupid way of writing it. So it's not yeah. apparent to us as to what exactly is going on here. But um, no, maybe there is a no, there is a different way of studying this or something. Okay. But but the sort of questions we may want to ask are the following. So I give you some set of generators. Okay. These are all permutations on some N elements and I give you very few of them. Okay. And I want to learn something about the group that they generate. Okay. So for instance, okay. The first thing we may want to know is the following. Can you tell me what is the size of this? group? They wrote down the Rubik's cube group by saying that it is generated by those bunch of groups. How do I find out how large is the Rubik's cube? Okay. Is this something that I can compute efficiently? Maybe that's the sort of question that you're interested in. That way that we might be able to answer Saurabh's question also, which is that Saurabh was asking, is it equal to A24? If you knew the size of A24 and you learned that this group did not have the same size, then you know they're not the same. So maybe you could ask that question. Or maybe you are interested in like, you no know, questions of this form. You are given some subset and I am interested in a particular permutation. Can you tell me, is that permutation in this subset or not? I mean, in the group generated by this subset or not? So think of it this way. You have an unsolved cube in your hand. You know, for a fact that you're only allowed to do up moves, down moves, left moves, blah, 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 blah. blah. When you are thinking about solving this cube, there is a particular permutation you are thinking about. That's the, that's what the sigma is playing a role of. And maybe you're interested in, do I know that this is this cube solvable? Okay. Or maybe if it is solvable, maybe I know it is solvable. Can you actually tell me how to compute the sigma by using moves that are present in this, in this set? I just want to keep making these moves and somehow get, uh, get this particular sigma. Okay. This could be one form of a question. And now here are these generic sort of statements you could ask, which is, I give you a certain subset of generators and you can ask, does the group that, that is generated by these things, does it satisfy blah, where you replace blah with whatever is your favorite property. Okay. If there are certain groups with certain kinds of properties you are interested in, maybe you could ask, is this something that I can efficiently figure out? Is my group of this type? Is my group of some other type, etc. Okay. And then some other things that you could ask is the following. Okay. By the way, this group G is okay. I have given this to you as a generating set. Okay. But I am actually interested in some other group, which I know is contained inside G. 
So that is, I'm saying that I'm given you a generating set for a group G. I am interested in a particular subgroup that I'm going to define using some condition. Okay, there's again some mental picture that I have of you know what this subgroup is. And I want to know, can you give me a generating set for this subgroup? I don't want, I have a generating set for the bigger thing. I am interested in the subgroup. Can you give me a generating set for that subgroup? Okay. So think of it this way. Okay. This is where graph isomorphism, etc., might become relevant. Suppose I have I have two graphs on n vertices. Okay. Maybe you have some weird statements of the form. Like if I am, if I'm allowed to do any form of shuffling between all the vertices, I end up with a group SN, the symmetry group on N elements for which I already know a generating set. But what am I interested in? I'm interested in only those permutations that preserves edges and non-edges. Maybe that's this condition. And you're asking, can you now tell me, are there things that sort of, you know, that give an isomorphism between this to that or something of that sort, some variant of this problem. Okay. So these are guises in which they might show up in when you're studying certain things. And, uh, and then these sort of questions we will actually not study, but turns out these sort of questions is the, was the crucial component in Babai's, uh, in Babai's graph isomorphism thing which is that you're just asking, does there exist a subgroup of this group with blah property? Like in the previous case, it somehow I had, uh, I had, at least you had some form of access to what this subgroup was and you're asking some properties about it, etc. But here you somehow have to search for subgroups with this property. Like for example, maybe I'm asking, does my group have a subgroup of size 42? Okay, and at the face of it, it's like, you know, it's unclear how you compute such things. So for example, a very, very important property turns out to be the notion of what is called a group being simple. And uh, these are things that require a lot more, uh, you know, sophisticated tools from computational group theory. But turns out many of these questions uh, turn out to be doable, which in my opinion is very, very surprising. I mean, the fact that given such a generating set, I hopefully convinced you that the generating set could be way smaller compared to the size of the group. But turns out, this is a question we can answer efficiently. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, Varun's question was, shouldn't it be called simple if it requires sophisticated tools? Uh, yeah. So, uh, RB, so, uh, yeah. so, so suppose some sub subgroup is generated by a, a small uh, subset. Mm -hmm. uh, then, if there is a sub subgroup of this subgroup, then is it like then is it easy to see or something that it will also be generated by a small group? Like oh, excellent. So yeah, these are all questions that we should be. I mean, like, is it even reasonable to ask these questions? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, like, for instance, suppose someone told you that no, find the size of this set size of the group generated by them. But if for some reason, suppose the size of the set was double exponential, how can you I even hope to write it down? Okay, but here you can say, no, 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 that you don't need to worry about it because it will be no more than n factor. So this is okay. But yeah, but things like this, it is unclear, right? I mean, sorry, uh, things like this. I just gave you some group that had a small generating set. You are interested in some damn subgroup. How am I even supposed to know that this there is a small generating set for it? Like, is it even you know, reasonable for you to ask me to write this down? So these are all questions that become very relevant because you know we are, I mean, these are questions we would be interested in, but not all the things that we are interested in turn out to be doable. But uh, but yeah, but these are very very relevant questions, and this is what we are going to explore in the in the next uh, in the next lecture. So. So yeah, so this is roughly going to be part one of the course. We will be dealing with these sorts of problems. We will come up with tools to solve these problems. And we will see that once we solve these problems, one of the things we get as a bonus from this is that these Rubik's cube and overtrack puzzles or something, there is some systematic way to solve them. It may not be the fastest way. I mean, if you want to participate in competitions, this is not the way to do this. But if all you care about is coming up with some systematic way to solve these things, it will give you a way of doing that. 
Okay, so that's going to be the goal. And uh, so what we will do in um, the next, ah, sorry. Uh, Saurav has question. some questions. Saurav yeah. has a question, which is, so computational group theory will deal only with finite groups. Yes. And in this course, we'll only be dealing with finite groups. In fact, they will all be subgroups of SN and N is often some fixed number that we are thinking about. I mean, it's a growing number, but it's like, you know, they're only dealing with you know, things that end up moving some end stuff. Okay. Uh, and we won't be dealing with infinite groups uh, at all uh, in this uh, course. Uh, well, that's not strictly true, but uh, but yeah, but at least in part one of the group, of the course, we will not be dealing with uh, these infinite groups. Okay. So the next class, uh, okay. Uh, Okay, and Saurabh said he has it out. Uh, you can type it out and then we'll address that. So the next class, what we are going to do is, and this is something that I think is very underrated for computer science people. It's a little unfortunate, but somehow it turns out that CS people are the people who do the least amount of coding. And somehow, uh, I mean, there are wonderful tools we have at our disposal and we should be using them. Like for instance, I hope that, you know, when you look at sage math so sage math is what we will be doing there'll be some parts of your assignments which will actually involve uh, you know doing some minor computation on sage but i mean it should be super surprising to you that you know you just feed in to sage saying by the way i have this weird puzzle you know it's like uh, there is a whatever dodecahedron things move this actually called the mega minx and stuff like that and you are interested in finding out how large is the size of the you can define the set of moves you are allowed, just like we did above. We wrote down what the two cross two Rubik's cube thing was. And you ask Sage, how large is the size of the group? It will tell you the answer in milliseconds. So clearly it's running some efficient computation. And it should you know, like sort of kindle our curiosity to sort of say, how the hell is it doing that? Or if you give it a particular permutation and ask, you know, is it this permutation? Or you ask Saurav's question, which is take the Rubik's cube, Two cross two cross two Rubik's cube group is it equal to a twenty four? And it will immediately tell you that the answer is yes or no. Like how is it able to do these things? So Sage is something that we will do for a lot of these sort of simple calculations that is sometimes a little painful to do by hand. There are tools like Sage that allows us to do that, so we'll get a bit more comfortable with Sage. And and the next lecture, what we will do is we will take the Rubik's cube as an example to tell you about some basics of group actions. There are these words that will get thrown at you, which are like called orbits or blocks or whatever. And it's, it's just that we'll always keep the Rubik's cube or something as a canonical example to ask, what really are we wanting to do here? And saying, ah, okay, this is what an orbit refers to, or this is what a block refers to, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And then we'll slowly start seeing some efficient algorithms once we address the sort of questions that Varun had asked, like are certain things even feasible? So we will first address those sorts of questions and we'll slowly start building the sort of algorithms we want to. And eventually we will, we will try to solve versions of all of them. Okay. So that's, I'll stop here. And just after answering Sora's question, when we see the <clears throat> Rubik's cube group in R3, can't we tell it from I saw R3. Uh, I don't quite follow the question. So I. Uh, so if we just consider that the. So you mean. So the isomorphism R3. So this is by R3, you actually mean the three dimensional real space? Yes, yes, yes. yes. So then that only corresponds to rotating everything together, right? So pieces will not move at all. It all all that will happen is the cube will rotate like like as a whole. Okay, 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 okay. So so it's okay. more complicated yeah, yeah. than that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So but but yeah, I mean like these are things that we may want to know. We want to know how large is this group, you know, and, uh, and stuff like that. So those are the sort of questions that we will try to address in part one of the course. So. So what I will do on Academy is I will, I mean, by the next lecture, I would, I would suggest that, you know, you people uh, get Sage math working on your machine. Okay. Even you don't actually need it on your machine. 
like even if you don't have it on your machine there are these uh, these sort of general cloud computing stuff which are these sage notebooks that you can use it's just it will turn out to be far slower uh, than you running on your machine and i think these are tools that are useful enough that i would highly recommend that you install it on your machine because i mean i mean they have these massive uh, sort of libraries that are built for improving these uh, computations things that you can't, don't need to do by hand okay and uh, it's quite useful to do that so uh, i'll just put up a maybe give a link to a short tutorial on just how to install it and in the next class we will just spend a little bit of time to see a few examples of how do you how do you work with sage okay and we'll be we'll barely be scratching the surface okay i mean the sort of questions i might want you to answer is things like one of your problem set questions might just be what is the size of the 4 cross 4 cross 4 rubik's cube okay i obviously don't expect you to compute this by hand but all i want to do is like for you to be comfortable enough that you can put this into sage and sage will just spit out an answer okay and then at a later point i mean like you know depending on the sort of problems that you encounter in life i mean you can maybe sage will help you with uh, with those things okay this is turning out to be i mean these are statements that can be taken out of context uh, to have very <laughs> uh, but nevertheless okay so that's going to yeah so that's what uh, we'll do in the next class uh, so i'll just stop here and maybe just take questions if people have any questions and if no if there are no further questions we'll just meet in the next class okay oh, let me check youtube uh, there isn't any there uh, okay so just a reminder i mean like in case there are people there seem to be some who are on youtube uh, in case you want to be uh, you know get notifications for the course etc be part of the discussions and so on just send me an email i'll send you a, an invite to academy because all discussions and general chat etc will happen there uh, so it will let you uh, be a part of those uh, yeah so the handwritten notes from today etc i'll figure out a mechanism to uh, to share them with you uh, mostly a some dropbox folder or something that we all have access to okay great so that's all i wanted to do today so we will meet uh, next uh, tuesday uh, next tuesday is what uh, which is feb 1st yeah we'll meet next tuesday at 11:30 okay see you all